I think we can get started. Uh, my name is Ellen Amster. I'm the Hannah Chan History of Medicine, and I organize the Hannah History of Medicine and Medical Humanities uh, speaker series. I'm going to ask everyone to definitely have some coffee and some cookies, especially the new arrivals should have coffee and cookies. Very important. Um, this is the last uh, talk in the series for this year, sadly. Um, but we'll have a, a, a very exciting finish. So I will take just a minute to tell you a little bit about our speaker for today. Um, oh, I'm sorry, before I do that, the, um, the co-sponsors to the talk are the Bachelor of Health Sciences program, the Department of Religious Studies, the Department of Family Medicine, and the Department of History. So thank you for all of our wonderful co-sponsors. And I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Carla Naffey. Carla Naffey um, is the Mellon Chair in History and Associate Professor at the University of Pittsburgh. Before she was at Pittsburgh, she was at UBC, where she held a CRC chair for eight years. Um, she completed her PhD at Princeton, and her first book is here. If you want to take a look at it, it has, it's a, has pride of place on my own shelf. It's called The Monkey and the Ink Pot, Natural History and Its Transformations in Early Modern China from Harvard University Press. Um, her research focuses on the history of bodies and their translations and transformations in the early modern world. Large largely based in work with Chinese and Manchu texts, and we'll learn the difference between those shortly. Um, she works also in short fiction, poetry, nonfiction, and podcasting. You can find out more about her work at www.carlanaffy.com. So today we're going to hear um, about some of her newer work, um, something in process, entitled Prepositional Bodies, Manchu Chinese Medicine in the Early Modern World. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Carla Nappi. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Um, so what you see here, um, I'll explain all of this in due time. This is a page from a text that I'll be talking about. Um, it's a Manchu language text. How many of you in here have ever heard of Manchu as a, as a language? Okay, few. How many of you read Manchu as a language? Not as many, so I will be talking you through that, um, and I'll, I'll just wait for that. Um, but that's what you're seeing here. Um, it's read differently from Chinese, um, and the image here is an anatomical figure that is labeled, and then um, here what you see is the explanations of what's being labeled. And all of this will become clear, I hope, in, the, in due course in the time to come. Um, so... Both of my talks this week, so I gave a talk yesterday, which was a very, very different kind of thing. There was no China content in the talk. Um, and so I mentioned there would be China content today. Um, and yesterday's talk was very much about the fiction and the poetry um, and the work that that does um, in terms of my larger work as a historian. Both of these talks are, in a way, experiments. And they're experiments in what reading is and what reading can be. So everything that I'm going to tell you today and really everything that I talked about yesterday can be ultimately boiled down to that one single major idea that animates a lot of what I do now as a historian and a maker of things. Thinking about and experimenting with what reading is. It's something that a lot of us probably take for granted. I'm trying to explore that as, a, as part of an art practice. Okay, so I'm also interested in experimenting in uh, or with what reading is in terms of how that might shape how we experience and understand the histories of the relationships between our bodies and the language we use to describe them. So that's another really fundamental part of what I'll be doing today with my time. It's part of a larger effort to think creatively and deeply and playfully and seriously about how bodies and language co-create each other. Okay, bodies and uh, flesh and words. So it's a project that's really trying to be a disciplinary. I know I didn't say transdisciplinary, I didn't say interdisciplinary. It's trying to be non-disciplinary, okay, a disciplinary, and move across the arts and humanities for inspiration in terms of how we understand the history of medicine and of attempts to understand and translate knowledge about and experiences of human bodies. So you're going to see all of this throughout the talk today. 
Now, what I want to do today with the time we have is take you deeply into an experiment in reading human anatomy as what I'm going to call a fundamentally prepositional space. Now, all I mean by prepositional space is the kind of phenomena that we think of when we think of to, from, with, after, during. Those words that make up such an important part of the language that a lot of us speak. And in some languages, they're prepositions. And in other languages, they're not prepositions. But those little connectors that we can take for granted that actually, um, as I understand my work and the world, really fundamentally shape and determine what it is to um, have a material experience as a body in the world. Okay, so prepositionality. Um, so fundamentally prepositional a space, a space that we can understand to be less importantly about individual objects, individual parts, individual organs, blood, lungs, spleen, as a like individual thing that stands alone that you can point to, and more fundamentally about, again, what I'm calling prepositional relations, to-ness, in-ness, from-ness, likeness. Basically, these are the sorts of relationships that bring things together and bring people together in space and time. And that, I want to argue, is really at the core of material experience, okay? relations in space and time. This is going to be an attempt to read documents from the history of medicine in China as archives of these sorts of relations. So what this is is going to be an attempt to read a document as an archive of prepositional experience. And I'll, we'll, we'll get to that in the time to come. Now, I'll do that first by laying out a kind of broad context for the project, by very briefly situating this work within a set of other projects as a way to give you a better sense of who this person is that you're listening to, right? I don't claim to represent every historian of Chinese medicine out there. Um, so I think it's useful in going with me into this text to first have a sense of like who I am as a historian and what I care about to shape what the project is. So we'll do that very briefly um, just at the beginning. And then we'll go deeply into the text that's pictured here. Now I'm doing that also to kind of briefly show you a range of kinds of sources um, since this is a, a kind of convocation around the history of medicine, right? Um, and medical and health sciences that have a range of kinds of sources that might not obviously seem to have anything to do with the history of medicine or bodies actually turn out to be really fascinating for understanding a history of bodies and their movements and their experiences in time and space. So I'm going to move through different scales here. We're going to zoom in and zoom out and I'll signal when we're doing all of that um, and when we're going to reorient together. Now, ultimately, the really deep cut, the zooming in to this text that's pictured here, is meant to illustrate a way, to kind of experiment with a way of conceptualizing anatomical bodies that I hope doesn't have to be about Manchu texts. It can be useful in understanding lots of different kinds of bodies and lots of different kinds of times and places that don't necessarily have anything to do with China. Right? So this is hopefully going to be more broadly relevant, um, and we'll see. We'll see if that happens. So first, um, we're going to zoom out to set some context. I'm trained as a historian. That's kind of the hat that I wear. That's what I do. And at this point in my career as a historian, I'm less interested in disciplinary fields or areas. Um, so I'm less interested in like Chinese studies, area studies as a space. I'm less interested in disciplines um, as spaces. And I'm much more interested in thinking about history as a practice and specifically as an art practice. Okay, so this is very much part of a larger effort to live scholar, scholarly life and scholarship as an art practice. And I'm happy to talk about um, what that means, like what, um, how we might uh, think about that later after the talk if you'd like. Now recently in a series of projects, I've been thinking about this alone and also with different collaborators in experiments in what it is to read. Okay? Now, illegible cities, this is a page um, of a set of Manchu poems that form the basis for a chapter in this book. This is a history book in progress that reads documents that we don't typically think of as genres of storytelling, grammars, language primers, glossaries, as sources for and elements of the narrative structure of telling an account 
of the history of translation in early modern China. And when I say early modern China throughout this talk, there's no like broad scholarly consensus on what early modern means, but if it's you work in a field where that's not a phrase that typically comes up, what I mean when I say that in the talk is largely the time period between like 1500 and 1800. So when I say early modern, I kind of mean the period of Chinese history that's around that time, from 1500 to 1800 for my purposes. Okay, so this book is about using kind of unusual sources to tell a story about translation in China, to and from non-European languages mostly, in that time period. I'm showing you this because one of the chapters of this book looks at bilingual glossaries that were translating vocabulary between Chinese and non-European languages, um, and all of these glossaries have sections for human body parts. Okay, so this is part of the larger context of the project I'm going to be talking to you about. Now what's really interesting here is that if you look at bilingual glossaries from this period, you find whole categories of words and phrases that translators are using to mediate interactions with travelers and boys and people at court. You learn the names of flowers, of plants, of trees, animals, medicines, medicinal drugs that would typically come up in conversation with foreign envoys. Lice and butterflies, glowworms, mad dogs, silver-haired horses. You learn terms for kinds of people and kinds of human bodies that were considered normal or abnormal. Mad men, scarred people, people with various physical disabilities. There are, language, there are terms in different languages that are quite different for talking about this. You learn to talk about body parts and the things one could do with and to them. Emotions, illnesses, qualities of character, states of relative drunkenness. And what's fascinating for my purpose here is that you learn that bodies in different languages are made of different parts. You learn that Siamese bodies were made up of rather basic stuff, faces with eyes and noses and ears, heads with hair, lipped mouths full of teeth and tongues. Their bodies could be fat or slender, each bearing chests and back and hands and feet, and they were full of meat and bones, heart and intestines, blood and gall, strength and chi. These are all the vocabulary terms that make up the body parts of a Siamese person and body according to these glossaries. You learn that Mongolian bodies, and this is, um, this is a page from the body part section of these, uh, one of these glossaries. You learn that Mongolian bodies had all the parts of their Siamese counterparts plus guts with livers and lungs and spleen, muscle and marrow, spines, fists and palms. None of this vocabulary was in the other glossary. Their hearts had different layers, their faces had different aspects. They dripped with sweat and phlegm and tears and a whole bunch of fluids that the other bodies didn't drip with. They could be exhausted or full of vitality. They could be ill or poisoned. They might be blind or deaf, bald, or walk with a limp. This is all part of the body parts um, of these glossaries. Their cheeks and throats were marked by dimples and whiskers. They had large teeth that sometimes protruded from their mouths. You learn that whoop, here we go, Muslim bodies. And by Muslim bodies, this is the term of art that's used to um, describe the kinds of bodies that are rendered in Arabic and Persian scripts in these glossaries. That's the term. Um, th uh, they included a person's language and thoughts and movements as body parts. Their yin and yang, or what's translated into Chinese as yin and yang, their character and fate, disasters they might befall, limbs and organs. They had hair on their faces and temples, and the other glossaries did not include terminology for hair that was specific to body parts. This is an examination paper um, for the Tibetan students who were studying in the Tibetan Bureau from the Academia Sinica. So I'm just showing you this as an illustration of this. You learn that the Tibetan body parts included strength and weakness as body parts, good fortune, thoughts, and ideas alongside the more commonly recorded bits like mouths and hands and eyes. Tibetan bodies, unlike other gloss uh, glossary bodies, could also contract skin ulcers. Other bodies couldn't. In other words, and this is a super, this is not the bulk of what I want to be talking to you about today, but I wanted to show you part of the context of what it could be to look at sources that might not obviously be relevant to the history of medicine, or look at sources that are relevant, obviously, to the history of medicine in unusual ways, which is what this talk is about. I wanted to show you kind of the broad, part of the broad range that this project today is part of. So through this, you learn that bodies have different parts different ways of being alive, 
different ways of being dead in some cases, depending on the languages they inhabited and the languages that inhabited them. There are different ways of being healthy and falling ill depending on the language, um, the language here, which is, for me, interesting. So that's another project that's trying to play with what reading is by reading unusual sorts of sources as medical history sources. Translating Vitalities is another project. This is a collective of anthropologists, medical practitioners of various sorts, historians, and artists who work in uh, different media from ceramics to video art to painting, um, and, and actually lots more, that come together to collaborate on projects that are kind of broadly based in vitalities and understanding vitality and vitalities as plural and always in translation. Okay. Um, here you have Jens. He's a medical practitioner based in London from a video that's part of a multimedia project that explores what an artist, a doctor, an anthropologist of medicine, and a historian are doing when they read the same text. So what this is, um, we got together. It's kind of a, this kind of launched a lot of this work. So we, were, um, we came together the first day of a gathering in Croatia. We were in a beautiful setting, and we thought, Hey, the theme for this gathering is touch. Let's read Merleau-Ponty on touch. Seems simple, right? You have four people who want to anchor a conversation together. We'll read the same essay on touch. And what we realized the morning that we got together is that what we each thought we were doing when reading the same text were the completely different practices, really just completely different, even though we were all given the same directions that seemed simple to do the same thing. So what we did is we launched a project that explored that, sort of what that was, but it is to read this text coming from the perspective that all of us um, are coming from. And there's a video archive of material from that um, that's up on our website, which you can find here. Um, you can explore here uh, the archive of the work that we're all collectively making together. And a lot of this work is about vitalities and the bodies um, that produce vitality. Okay. Then there's meta gestures. Um, this is the third project that I'll give you, and the final one I'll give you as context. Now, this is a co-authored book um, with uh, cultural and media theorist Dominic Petman of short fictions that we wrote inspired by a particular theorist, Willem Flusser. Has anyone in here heard of Flusser? You probably haven't, right? People, you want, yes, because you, you were at the top yesterday, right? So you have extensive knowledge of Flusser now. So Flusser um, is the most famous usually in the Anglophone world for a book that he co-wrote about vampire squid. So people usually know him as the vampire squid guy. Um, but he also wrote this book on gestures, on the theory of physical gestures. So this is a book that responds to that book and that theory um, by reading Flusser's text through, by using fiction. So what we're doing here is trying to use fiction, writing short stories, as a way of reading a text. And I can talk to you about that um, later if you'd like. So this is um, our short fictions in this book, which is coming out this month or next month, are inspired by Flusser's book about how we might understand and recognize bodily movements as meaningful across time and space, in a way about how we might translate bodily gesture. You'll see that concern coming up um, in what comes next. And that's one of the reasons I'm flagging this, is that a concern with movement and how to translate movement and proximity, closeness, or farness in space and time is very much at the heart of the project that I'll focus on um, in a moment. Um, and we use short fiction writing as a way to read this other book. So writing can be a way of reading, um, is part of the take home here. OK, so when I say that what I'm going to be showing you today is about reading a text as something else, right? Reading a text as something in particular, it's part of this larger sensibility, and it's part of a scholarly commitment to explore reading as a creative practice of attention that involves the whole self. To explore reading, I want to say that again because this is really important. Like if you come away with nothing else, like from this whole talk, and you're like, ah, oh, Manchu, who cares about Manchu? You're like, no one should study it, which is fine, you know, like I disagree. Reading as a practice of attention that involves the whole self. This is really important to all of this work, um, and certainly to the work that I'm going to show you in a moment. Now, these different projects may seem, on the surface, not to have much in common, right? I mean, they're very, very different. But as I hope you'll see by the end of the talk, a lot of what I'll be showing you today is very much about the metamorphoses that come with proximity, the way transformations happen 
to nearness and, and closeness or, or distance. Okay? Um, and I really do believe that with bringing together of disparate things on multiple scales. So uh, this putting these together and thinking about them together changes all of them individually. Um, and that's also really, uh, really important for my work. So let's zoom in. Okay, we zoomed out. Now we're going to zoom in to this particular project. Um, and it's time to reorient to the scale of one page and its interaction with your body. And I mean that really, like your body um, and my body. Before I explain a little bit more about what's happening on this page, what it is, why I'm so interested in it, I want to ask you to look at this image with me, to attend to this image with me. And in doing so, what I want to ask you to do is to think with me about what an object is in the broadest sense, about what it is to be an object and why that matters, like why, why it would make sense to try to think um, capaciously about that. So let's think about an object that's fe featured prominently in this image, which is skin. Okay, so this is an image, an illustration of um, the sort of the internal anatomy of the nose. And what you see here are skin flaps pulled away. So let's think about noses and let's think about skin. And when you think about skin or about objects in general, I want you to think about, even just for this moment, movement and proximity. Okay, it's at the heart of this. Now imagine with me that things are made of movement. Not saying that things move. Things are made of movement. Okay? Imagine, for example, the skin on your nose. That skin becomes activated as a thing in the world when it's set into motion and into relationships of proximity with other things or when it's attended to, when attention is paid to it. A breeze blows over it and makes it itch. Your finger reaches up to scratch it. You glance at it in the mirror. You brush a tissue over it to catch a sneeze. You wash it with tingly soap. In the morning, you feel it wrinkle up when you smell something acrid or smoky. Now, whether you're experiencing these events yourself or reading about them or imagining them, watching them after the fact, these are the moments, arguably, when the skin on your nose becomes an active, storied thing in the world. Now imagine that all of the objects of history are like this, that all of the objects of history are like the skin on your nose. They are processes. They are relationships of proximity. They are encounters. They're aggregates. They are places where motion happens. They are loci of motion. Now imagine that we were not trying to write a history of that patch of skin on your nose, but instead of those forms of movement, of those kinds of proximity of those kinds of encounter that it catalyzed, the experience of being cooled or scratched, the experience of being looked upon, a history of the experience of being inside, a history of being under, a history of what it is to be on top of. Imagine if that were the object that we were looking at, right? A history, what would it mean to take this experience and to write or to tell or to understand a history of being inside? What could that be? Right? How would we do that? How would we make an archive of documentary traces of these forms of movement and of these ephemeral coming together and moving apart? Like, What would our archive be? What would it look like? What would a story about the processes and relations that that patch of skin produced look like? And what kinds of work could it do? Now the rest of today's talk is about a project that tries to explore and in some ways answer these questions. Okay? This is what this project is about. What does it mean, what could it mean to write a history of trueness, of likeness, of witness? Okay? That's what this is about. Now I'm actually trying to produce a history like what I just described, a history of the ways that ephemeral relationships, comings together, and comings apart produce material experience, often in the ways, or often via the ways we tell stories with and about them. And I'm trying to use this as a way to think about the craft of the historian, what it is that a historical practice is and looks like. And one of the texts I'm working with in order to do that is this text um, that I've been pointing to. Now this text is interesting for me because I'm particularly interested in histories of sensation. Okay? and in the ways that language helps produce sensory experience.
And then what happens to that productive relationship in the context of translation? How, how is sensory experience translated and how does that metamorphose what's happening? That's part of what I'm interested in. Now it turns out that Manchu is a particularly interesting playground for this because it was used as an early modern medium to translate knowledge related to sensory experience. All right, so let's zoom out again. So you all with me? You kind of get the basic premise? Does anyone not like feel like they're with me on some important level that like, yeah, what's, what's, well, what do I, I was doing? hoping you could repeat that one sentence where you said, what does it mean to write a history of the ways that ephemeral relationships create material experience, bodily experience? So the point there is like, generally, what if as a historian, or what if as just a person, you wanted to pay attention to not this chair, right, but to on top of, like the fact that this chair is on top of this. And let's say you thought of like the way we live in the world as things that relate to each other, the way things relate to each other and the relations they have with each other. Maybe that's the chair and the book. Maybe that's you and me. Maybe that's the paper and the pencil. It's an animal and the thing that's either trying to steal it or kill it, right? That it's those relationships that really make a, an important part of how the world works and why it works the way it works. It's not the thing, it's how they come into relation with each other. So let's say we wanted to be a force, of, a force in the world that helps people reorient towards paying attention to how we relate to each other, to animals, to plants, to the non-human, to other things. And he wanted to do that by writing a story that was about that. And so it helped draw people's attention to the fact that the fact that you exist and I exist is fine. The fact that we exist together changes both of us. And it's those changes that make the world what it is. And we're in this, like, ambit for the we're in this time, the whole planet is maybe a lot of us are focused on relationships with care and relationships with each other as a way to try to figure out how to live with each other. So telling stories about relations and helping focus people's attention on those relations is maybe one way that as a historian or a storyteller, you can draw people's attention to that. Okay, so let's say, um, as a, you're a historian, right? You're like, I'm a historian. So to do that, you're like, what if I wrote a history of relations about objects? What if I think that relations um, of prepositional or omnis or terminus are really important? And so I want to write a history of on top of this. So, so how do I do that? That's the plan. Is that, is that what you're doing? Yeah, so I keep listening. You know, okay, so but, but that's kind of the project, right? It's like it's a lot of fancy words to basically um, encapsulate this super simple idea of if I want as um, a historian tell stories about relations. And I think the kinds of relations that are important are those kinds of relations. Like, how do I tell that story? Because what a historian does is work from some kind of archive, some sort of source base, as evidence to tell a story that they think might be true in some way. And I don't mean necessarily exactly factually accurate, I mean true, right? And those are kind of different, but those aren't the same thing. So as a historian, like, how do I find that archive? Um, that's the problem. And so my answer to this right now is I'm going to find my archive in a text that already exists by paying attention to it in a way that transforms it into the archive that I need. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. So that's one. Any other questions before we move in? That's the that's the project, and those are the stakes, right? Those are also the bigger stakes, like ha like telling a history of relations. Okay, but to get there. Um, I told you I'd explain a little bit about what Manchu is and why it matters and like why as a Chinese historian you might be interested in this language that not a whole lot of people know a whole lot about. So I'm going to give you a map from the internet to do that. This is the Qing Empire. This is a super crash course in like what the heck is Manchu and why would, it, uh, why would you care. So the Qing Empire, like what you need to know for my purposes is that if you are um, Qing Empire, 1644 to 1911, it's ruled by people who call themselves the Manchus. And they have a different language. It's not Chinese. It's Manchu language. And that's the language that the documents I'm showing you today are in. This is an interesting period for any of us who want to understand China as not just a kind of monolithic place that's characterized mostly by the Chinese language, 
but China as a multi-ethnic space, as a multilingual space, as a colonial space, as an imperial space. The Qing is an awesome time period to look at that because this is the period where China doubles in size. This is the period where Tibet and Xinjiang um, and all like places that we think of now as part of the empire are coming into the empire, along with the languages that the people there are speaking and writing, in, along with lots of different forms of life. So if you're interested in thinking about the transformations that occur with kind of explicit wrestling with different languages and different forms of knowledge and ways of understanding the human body and ways of getting sick and getting um, better, this is a great time period to look at. And this is what draws me to the Qing in the first place. Okay, so Manchu is the official language of the Qing Empire. Um, and this is a text, um, just to kind of illustrate to you what Manchu looks like, super different from Chinese. You read it top to bottom, it's an alphabetic language. Um, and I can tell you lots more about it later if you want. This is a page from a text that was for medical, medical practitioners who are trying to learn the categories of medical drugs. So this was a mnemonic text with poems um, that you memorize to memorize the qualities of medicinal drugs. And it was a Manchu translation from a Chinese text. So what's interesting for me about this is that the Manchu translation also rhymes, like it's also works as a poem, but in a different way than the Chinese one does. But this is a text that you would, like if you were studying medicine, memorize to memorize the medicinal qualities of like chrysanthemum um, or deer horn or something. And this is just to show you, this is the same term in Chinese and in Manchu. It sounds fairly similar, but just to show you next to each other, like they're really, really different scripts and they're really different languages. Okay, but let's move on. Well, this is the name of this Manchu text for any of you who might be interested. It's the Okpoibani Hubika. Who, I just wanted to say Manchu out here so that you can hear it. Who here is a term for a kind of poem? Bika just means text. Um, and this is the kind of properties of medicinal drugs. So this is just to show you what I'm showing you here. Now, I'm interested in Manchu language as a medium of translation about the knowledge of bodies, drugs, plants and animals, stones, those sorts of materials, diseases across early modern Eurasia. So that's one of the reasons I'm really interested in this language, is this is a language that's used by people who don't self-identify as Manchu, like French Jesuits, as you're going to see in a minute, to translate knowledge across different contexts. Um, so it's a medium of translation, and that's why I'm kind of interested in it, or one of the reasons. Now, this was happening especially in the 17th and 18th centuries, but not just, in lots of different kinds of texts that don't naturally seem to otherwise come together into a single conversation. And this is a, if you get to know me, this is a theme, right? Like bringing together things that don't obviously seem to come together. Just to show you, um, this is from this text that I showed you. Um, these are texts about medicinal drugs and their qualities. Poems about plants, animals, and their relationships with people. This is um, from a poet named Jack Dan, who flourished in the late 18th and mid 19th centuries. Multilingual works on Materia Medica. And this is from an early 19th century text, um, which is in Tibetan, about Mongolian Materia Medica. And one of the really interesting things here is that often the objects have the drugs have um, names in Tibetan and Chinese and Mongolian and in Manchu, um, all labeled there. Um, and it's just, if you're interested in naming and translation, it's a pretty cool text to work with. And topically organized dictionaries like this one that include sections of terms that are devoted to body-related terminology. So this is a later um, five-language pentalingual version of the kinds of glossaries I opened this talk talking about, right, with groups of terms about body parts. So this is from the Qing. Um, these are five languages of the Qing that you see here. Uh, Manchu, which is the head language, Tibetan, um, we have Mongolian, Uyghur, and Chinese. Right? Here's what's really cool about this. Uh, well, one of the things that's really cool about this, there are entire sections of vocabulary in this um, dictionary that are devoted to like sounds. So like onomatopoeia, like meow, quack, there's like pages and pages and pages of just onomatopoeia. How do you translate a sound into five languages? It's an interesting conceptual problem that I'm interested in. There's also a whole section on experts, on curse words, okay? So like if I were to say, for example, this is an actual one, I don't think this about you, 
I think you're fabulous, but if I were to say, you maggoty maggot face, right, which Ellen is not, emphatically not, and you better be, but if I were to do that, right, in cursing, it's not just about the content of what you're saying, right? It's a kind of, you're making a gesture that transforms in another way, or in some way, the person into what you're talking about, right? It's a metamorphic gesture. It's a kind of um, magical transformative gesture when you're cursing. I, whether you're using words, you're using gestures, there's a whole section in this dictionary of curses that you then translate into four other languages after Manchu. And for me, that's just really interesting, right? How do you translate this sort of metamorphic event from language to language. And so these are just some of the um, some of the phenomena that I'm looking at and that you can look at if you're interested in the history of bodies. And it's interesting, uh, it's interesting from the perspective of, I think, the history of medicine and healing in bodies, because a lot of these curses involve um, rotting or dead or sort of marginally alive bodies of other beings um, that are made that the human is made into in that process so anyway just to show you part of the range of what you can look at here and this is from the 18th century okay but this right here is what i'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about today um, anatomical texts now specifically as i said before what i've been trying to do with this ana anatomy text in particular is to try to find a way to read it not as a book about like lungs and spleen um, nose etc but as I said, as a book about the way that kinds of orientation in time and space, okay, um, what, I've what I'm calling prepositional experience, to-ness, from-ness, after-ness, through-ness, likeness, create bodily experience and understandings and translations thereof. Now I'm interested in how this particular text as a translation, and I'll explain that in a moment, is producing relations and specifically the kinds of relations that generate bodily experience and material experience. Okay, so this is a page, and these are all pages from a text that's often colloquially referred to as the Manchu anatomy. And that's how I'm going to refer to it from here on out. It's just simpler, the Manchu anatomy. Um, but its formal name is more like this, the Derbichi Tokubuha Gati Chuan Bitra. Now those who speak Chinese or who understand Chinese in the audience will hear like, and we'll think, potentially think, oh, this is a translation of a Chinese text because is Chinese. It's not. Um, this is a text that was always in Manchu. There's no Chinese version. It wasn't translated from Chinese. Okay? But this is um, just to give you a sense of the title. Now, this is just for those of you who like these sorts of facts. Um, this was produced at the Kangxi court, um, and that's the reign period. This is a text that's often, if you look it up in a bibliography, credited to Jesuit missionaries, okay? Including these guys right here as authors. But practically speaking, the, re the reason I am giving you all of this is I treat this text as a product of collaboration, collaborative authorship. What happened in the, in the um, process of writing this text is that Kangxi like, asks the Jesuits to produce a text that translates Western anatomy or Western medicine into Manchu. And when I say Western, that's an active category, right? That's a, it's meant to represent whatever kind of knowledge the Jesuits were bringing into the Manchu court to translate that. Um, so he asks them, he also gives them Manchu language tutors and he tells them this has to be in Manchu. Why would he say this has to be in Manchu? It's gonna protect access to it. Because that way, if you didn't read Manchu, you weren't allowed to read the text, okay? So it's written in Manchu, but it is impossible for me to imagine that the Manchu language tutors who they were working with didn't in some way impact the text. And also, Kangxi personally demanded that every 10 pages that they wrote, they send to him so that he could correct the grammar. And we actually had a manuscript copy with his corrections, right? So really, like I understand the, um, the authorship of this text as being kind of broadly collaborative, but if you were to look it up and are looking up um, literature about it, you're going to find the authorship credited to those Jesuits, okay? Okay, so it's not, just to be clear, this is not a book that's a translation of any single text. There are elements of this text that are based on a French and a Danish work of anatomy, but there's also a lot of other stuff in there that is not 
directly translated scenes from any individual text. So it's a, it's a translation in the broadest sense of the word of knowledge rather than of any particular texts. Now some of the images are just kind of vaguely resonant with images from European anatomical texts, but others are more clearly copies. So if you see this, you can kind of see um, a kind of a family resemblance. It's pretty hard to see this. This is the age of the Manchu anatomy, which is not. Okay, this is an earlier text. Pretty hard to look at this and not imagine there was some sort of copying of the image done there. Um, now the images of this text are so striking that a lot of the literature on this is really about the images. Okay? This is, um, this is a manuscript that exists in most versions in more than 600 pages. A tiny fraction of those are illustrated. Okay? But it's the illustrations that have gotten most of the attention because you have to kind of read Manchu to be able to talk about the text. And again, access to Manchu language training is not something that a lot of people have. Um, so my project is really about focusing on the text itself. But if you're interested in the images, there is literature on that. Um, and it's actually kind of really interesting. The images seem to be cobbled together from a lot of different kinds of texts, and some of them, um, and as you'll see, I'll show you some of them, don't seem to necessarily be copied from anywhere. Some of the figures are dressed in traditional Manchu dress. Some of them are not. Some of them look like they could be right out of Vesalius. Others aren't like that at all. So there's, this is to say, if you're interested in the images, and I'm going to show you a bunch of them in the time that remains, um, it's not the case that they all follow a particular style or that there's a coherence to the images as a body, aside from the fact that they were in this, in this text, okay? Okay, so how's the text put together? What's the anatomy of this text before we go in and look at noses? Um, and I take you into a deep cut of this like prepositional stuff. The text is in two main parts. Now the images I'm going to show you are from a manuscript of the first part that's kept at the National Li uh, Library in France that totals more than 600 manuscript pages. And they now own like a kidney and a lung um, for making me a high resolution scan. So if anybody is interested in this and wants a high resolution scan, um, I can give it to you. Um, I wouldn't recommend trying to get one yourself. It's very expensive. I've already got one. I'll just send it to you, OK? Great. Um, so when all of you become Manchu Studies scholars and you're like, I want to work on that text, and I'll just send you the PDF so you can keep all of your organs and you don't have to pay them extra money. Okay, so the first volume is called The Upper Part. Um, here we have a discussion of uh, the body and how it's put together. There's an introduction here to the idea of a divine creator um, and the creation of humankind. Here's a quotation or translation from this. Man is the most enlightened, noble, and virtuous of everything between heaven and earth. This is because his material body and immaterial soul, after being bound to one another to form one body, are connected to the material heavens and immaterial Lord who brought them into being along with the heavens. This is in this anatomy text. Okay. Here's another quote, just to give you a sense right, of this. This is a Jesuit text. If we attain through understanding of the circumstances of the material body and the immaterial soul, so in this anatomical text, you have the body and soul being discussed right at the beginning. The material body and immaterial soul, by exerting ourselves, we will clearly understand the unending wondrous virtue of the Lord who brought it into existence, having recovered truth, honor, goodness, love, and enlightenment, we will be able to easily obtain the eternal peace of our soul and will be able to understand the method for bringing peace and longevity to our physical bodies. This is a text that's saying at the outset, here's why you should study anatomy. Because in doing so, like there's some higher purpose and you, you connect with your soul and you can bring peace to your body clearly, right? Like there's something going on in this text that's not just about uh, the physical body. This is the Jesuit text. There's also an account here of a divine watchmaker and of the circulation of blood and the dissection of frogs. Um, so you can see this text is also in aspects of it being used as a kind of tool for conversion, right? Like this was, this, there's an agenda here. Okay. Um, then we have a section on the head and neck and the sort of external parts as we move down, are sh the shoulder and arm. And in each case, I'm showing you an illustration from the relevant section of this text, just to give you a flavor of the visuality of this text. Then you have the breast and belly, lower back, lower leg, and all of these organs over here, okay? 
You can already see probably that the illustrations are really different in style, right? This is just to give you a sense for those of you who are interested in the visuality of this text. There's a lot of different stuff going on here. And then finally, there's a section on blood and spirit. If you are interested in history of Chinese medicine and you're interested in the way the concept of qi is, is um, translated into Manchu, this is another reason why I'm saying this text is really complex as a translation of kinds of knowledge. There are discussions of Chinese medicine in this text, and of qi in particular, and those fall under the rubric of sukun in Manchu. So if you're looking for qi in Manchu text, you would look for sukun as a translation of that. There's a whole section on blood um, and qi, basically. Okay, there's also a second volume, and this has discussions of the history of medicine and disease, various sorts of diseases. There are medical prescriptions in this as well, okay? So this is just to say this is a huge, huge, um, there's, you know, this is a huge text. There's a lot of fascinating stuff in it. Now, I've been trying to pay attention to this text. And when I say pay attention, it's hopefully it's already clear. I mean, I don't mean to take that for granted as a process. I mean to pay attention as a conscious practice, as a conscious act, okay? I've been trying to pay attention to this text, to read this text as an archive of kinds of relationships that produce material experience, as I mentioned. Now, to understand how I'm doing that, let's just super briefly look at an example, and then we'll pull out, and I'll draw us to a conclusion, okay? But we'll go zoom into this example first. What I'm going to do is take us into the discussion of, into the section of the text on head and neck, okay? Now, if you're interested, as I am, in sensation and its histories, if you're interested in the ways that the authors of this text are dealing with problems of translation that are related to sensation, that are related to material experience, that are related to sensory perception, um, or more generally, that if you're interested in how they're trying to explain the ways that built structures of the body create sensory experience by producing certain kinds of relations in space and time, okay? the way that built structures of the body produce sensory experience by producing kinds of relations in space and time, this is a great place to find that, okay? Um, this is a great place where those issues are resonant because there's a lot of discussion in these sections of this broader chapter on the head and neck that are explicitly dealing with problems of sensation. Okay, I'm only gonna take you into um, one in particular. But if I had, I'm sure you're all like, I wish we could be here for like seven hours and do the whole thing. If we had seven hours together, um, I could take you into all of these and we could look at sound and the voice, right? We could look at, which is also coming up here, we could look at taste um, in saliva. We could look at a whole bunch of ways that sensory experience is manifest in the many, many pages of this section of the text. But we're going to instead just zoom into the nose and into smell, just as an example. Okay, so the section on the nose. Now the nose here, um, in this section of the text, acts as a kind of mediator, a kind of translator of exactly the sorts of relationships and encounters that I've been talking about and that I'm interested in. And this happens in lots of ways that we can group for the sense for the sake of clarity and simplicity, under three major categories. I'm going to quickly take you through those. One, okay, the nose mediates relations. It, it translates relationships between a human body and the material environment that that body consumes and perceives through its senses. Okay, so first, relations between the human body and the material environment that the body's part of. And I'll show you just a couple of examples of that. Um, the book describes, for example, the way two holes in the nose distinguish foul from pleasant odors. It describes the way the nostrils help one to smell things before eating or drinking them to determine whether they're safe to consume. I'm showing you this because these are just a couple of examples of the way the nose mediates relations of that first sort between the body and its kind of sensory environment, okay? So it mediates relations between the human body and the material environment the body consumes and perceives through its senses. The second way it does this, and there are only three, we're almost there, the nose also mediates relations and encounters between the different sizes and shapes of the human body in time and space. So fundamental to this understanding of anatomy is that the body changes in time and the body changes depending on the kind of space it's in, and the nose helps um, 
embody those transformations and help you understand those uh, transformations. And just to give you a couple of examples, right? Talks about the variation in size and shape of human noses. So there's a whole section of here that uh, of this text that talks about different noses that you might find out in the human environment and which help you breathe better or worse. It talks about the skin of the nose and how oily it is and what makes it oily. This is really interesting. It talks, it has, there's a whole section that talks about the way the nose changes or not when you gain and lose weight. So there's a whole theory in this book that depending on how you gain and lose weight, it changes the shape of your nose. And also how the nose moves or not over the course of a lifetime. So there's a whole discussion in this text that takes for granted that for some people, as your body moves in time, so does your nose. Okay, so this is, and, and there's also a whole bunch of other things that I won't go into, um, but it's, it's really, really interesting. In particular, if you're interested in the aesthetics of the body or aesthetics in the human body, there's a lot of material in this section that talks about that. Okay, so it's, I think, particularly interesting. Okay, so this is the second kind of encounter the nose mediates. Relations of the human body in time and space with other instantiations of that body and of other bodies. Okay, three, the nose mediates relationships and likenesses. And likenesses, this is important. The nose mediates relationships and likenesses that come from habitual proximity to other entities in the world. That's a fancy way of saying the nose mediates the kinds of relations that come from what you spend time with in the world. So that which you spend time with in your life, in the world, in your daily life, um, affects your body. Um, and the nose is a, is a kind of exemplar of that, OK? All right, for my purposes here, for this part of the project that I'm into right now like at this minute, this is really important. Because this very kind of relationship is a relationship about likeness. And I'm really, really interested in this text and how the translator is describing how things are like other things as a way to explain them. So if you're a translator, and you're translating a whole bunch of ideas for an audience that, um, or for readers, and you're not quite sure if they're going to understand what you say, you might compare it to something else, right? This is like this other thing, right? This is like when you do X. This is what they were doing a lot in this text and in this section in particular, right? So um, the bones of the nose are like small leaves on a tree branch, like the teeth on a saw like picks used to play stringed instruments, um, like various tools used in animal husbandry. Um, so this is really interesting because we have some moments where the translators are trying to describe physical characteristics in Manchu that don't otherwise exist in Manchu. And so when this happens, they resort to analogy and to the use of terms that they think the readers are going to be better familiar with, right? So what you get from this in part is a sense that the translators think their readers are going to be familiar with trees, are going to be familiar with saws, are going to be familiar with animal husbandry equipment, um, with stringed instruments, right? So you get a sense of what the translators are assuming is the kind of habitual everyday environment or the habitual environment of the readers, which I think is kind of interesting. Okay, now this is also very much what happens in the case of other body parts in the text um, with, the com with components that the translators seem to think are going to be unfamiliar potentially to readers, right? Um, and if we wanted to, we could go back to, we could go to the skin section. Um, I'm not going to take you through this in detail, but I just want to show you as another example, similar to the case of the nose, the skin is a translator. Okay, the skin is a translator and a mediator of uh, relations for the body, and it produces relations of acrossness, of throughness, etc. Now, relationships are constantly and consistently a part of the discourse of skin in this text. Relations among animal and human, among normal and abnormal, instrument and goal. Um, the archive of skin is also an archive of relations and encounters. And similar to the case of the nose, the discussion of skin relies heavily on recourse to likenesses, stuff that's like other kinds of things. Now when we look carefully at this section of the text, there's lots of moments like the nose where the translators seem to be worrying that something is unclear to readers um, and uh, they're worried that the translation is not going to convey what they wanted to convey and these potential moments of rupture generate a need to explain. At these moments of rupture, the discussion all often invokes a likeness, a comparative example, a comparison. 
Um, so we see lots of these in skin. There are comparisons to animal bodies, to clothing, to household materials. Um, so there's a discussion um, up here, household materials. The text says, the formation of skin in the womb is kind of like what happens if you take a bowl of hot milk and you leave it out in the cold air and skin forms on it. That's like what happens in the womb. Here, they describe how it is that you feel things by comparing the skin to a brain and by saying the skin, the skin thinks the way the brain thinks. So there's co explicitly they say this, there's a kind of cognition in the skin that's re like related to the way the mind thinks and that's how we feel with our skin, right? This recourse to likenesses. For me, this kind of stuff is fascinating. Like I totally dig this and so there's a lot of this in this text, okay? Um, there's a comparison uh, in terms of animal bodies to snakes molting. So what the, skin, uh, what the text says is that when skin is, is burned and it blisters, the movements and the generations of the skin are like wild animal skin and hair. It's like when um, snakes molt. Um, it describes a skin as a kind of clothing, etc. I could go on and on, and I will not. If you read, this is the take-home point here, if you read beyond the anatomical text as just a description and start to see it as a kind of archive of relationships, it actually becomes a different text. Um, it becomes a different kind of thing, right? Um, and it becomes an archive of these kinds of relations that I, that I talked to you about, right? One, two, three, these kinds of um, sensory experience producing relations. Okay, so the archive of skin in the nose is an archive of relations and encounters, but at this point, Right, we're still holding the nose and skin stable as objects. Um, and I said at the beginning that's not what I wanted to do. Right? I wanted to instead um, write a history of encounters and relations. So if we turn away from looking at skin or nose as objects and instead treat those that we're reading the text as indexes, as places that show us where likenesses are, where relations are, where um, uh, these kinds of prepositional relationships are, then we can pay attention to the text in a way that those relations become the archive uh, or become the object of study. And we can transform the text by reading into an archive of relations. So those relations become technologies producing ways to translate material experience. Okay, and we can sort of, um, the way I'm doing this right now, just concretely, right, I'm really interested in how um, this text, how you can trace sameness and likeness in this text. Okay, I'm interested in producing a history that's in part a history of sameness or likeness. So if we look for moments where the translation likened a potentially unfamiliar term or thing to a thing that they assumed would be more familiar to the reader, we can keep track of those moments. And if we keep track of those moments, we can identify the way language is used or the way the text uses technologies, right? Certain grammatical forms, certain phrases, certain words that always come up or often come up when likeness is invoked. Um, and then we can look for those technologies elsewhere, right? So you look for the sections that are um, like the nose and the skin. You see where they're talking about likenesses. You make a list of all the terms and the linguistic technologies that are used to show something's like something else. And then you reread the text just looking for those terms. And then what you're reading for is likenesses. Right? You're reading to see where things are like other things. And then by doing that, you transform the text into something else, and you're reading it as an archive of likenesses. You feel me? Like, as, like in the process of reading it, the text actually becomes something different than it might be otherwise. Okay? We've transformed it through reading into something new and into something that lets the objects drop out, so then the, the nose and the skin aren't the important thing anymore. Adali is the important thing, a Manchu term that's often used to describe likeness. Something else that relates things becomes, you see what I mean? It's, it's actually really cool. It's a really cool thing to do. Okay, so this way of reading the Manchu anatomy allows me to focus my attention on the metamorphoses happening in the text and the technologies that enable them. The processes that are producing material experience or at least ways of trying to language that experience. And thus it puts my focus on movement, on proximity, on ephemerality, and on moments of coming into being rather than on stable objects as individuals, okay? Um, so this is true in the, for the nose. This is true of other head parts like the ear, the voice box, the eyes, okay? 
So an anatomy text instead becomes an archive of proximal relationships and kinds of movement. And a history of skin and nose and ear and voice become instead a very different kind of history of moments where sameness and likeness are produced. And we can go back um, and do the same exercise, um, which I'm like, just at the beginning of trying to do, with other kinds of relations that produce material experience, with onness. You could read this whole text just as an archive of throughness, of betweenness, of afterness. And like I said before, for me, one of the reasons to do this is to demonstrate and start bringing into being a kind of history that's really focused on relations and, and comings together and being together. And with that, we have a history of prepositional bodies. Um, and thank you for going with me on this journey. I'm happy to talk about any of this stuff or stuff I didn't say that I might know a little bit about. So thank you, and let's have a conversation. So what can I do to help? Any questions or anything you'd like to talk about? Yeah. Just as a starting point, mm -hmm. you said it, uh, there's a place where you can do so I'm not sure that I can identify with the text on the Right. So, the, um, so this is this dictionary that's uh, not this text, right, but the dictionary. I'm sorry for anybody, like close your eyes if you don't like rapid flipping through images. Close your eyes. I'll tell you when we're there. Da 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 still going, really not pleasant to look at. And my, did my computer freeze? It did. No, there we are. Oh, perfect. Okay. Now you can open them. So this one here. At the top is Manchu. Then it's Tibetan. Then you have a Manchu rendering of what the Tibetan sounds like. Because it's not assumed that the reader of this dictionary, and this is called the, um, this is a Qing, Wu Qi Qing Wen Jian. So in Chinese, that means Wu Ti, the, the five forms of the five scripts, Qing Wen Jian, it's a um, comprehensive Qing dictionary, right? Um, that's just kind of a rough indication of what the text is. Um, and this is the uh, Qianlong era text for those who might be interested in this. So it's um, Manchu, Tibetan, a Manchu rendering of what the Tibetan sounds like, Mongolian, and it's assumed here, which is interesting, that the reader of this can sound out the Mongolian, Uyghur, okay? Um, a Manchu rendering of what the Uyghur sounds like, again, not assuming that someone is going to know how to sound this out. And then at the bottom, it's Chinese. So the Jesuits weren't in... This was a different text. That's not oh, the Manchu sorry. anatomy. No, that's okay. Sorry. This is the... No, that, that's fine. This is, the, um, this is a different text that I showed you as part of this to give you a sense of the kinds of text in Manchu, or using Manchu, that if you were interested in a history of medicine or body or that sort of thing, um, you might not think of a dictionary, a collection of poems, a, a text about materia medica, uh, like a, some, an anatomical text fundamentally being part of the same conversation. So I just showed you this to show you the range of kinds of texts that you can bring into conversation that are all arguably relevant to this history um, that might not otherwise scream out as being like relevant to the history of medicine, like a collection of Manchu poems, right? You might not think for a dictionary. Um, but this is a different text from the one I focused on, which is up here. All right. Put up Mr. No's other question. Yeah. Thank you for that. This is fascinating. I just wanted to ask you, uh, looking at the composition here, there are ones that were more commonly used than others, and does that also warrant Examination that you know were there specific prepositions that people focused on in terms of um, relationships. Absolutely, and so to just to be clear, like I'm using the word preposition and prepositional because it's a, a simple way of indicating the kinds of relations that in English are usually prepositional, but in Manchu they're not always prepositions, right? Sometimes they come after or they're attached as verbal endings to words. So those kinds of terms in Manchu, yes, there are definitely ones that are more common than others. But I'm just at, um, you can imagine this is really time consuming, right? Um, because you're sort of reading and rereading the text over and over again in different ways to transform it into different kinds of archives, and that just takes time. So I'm at the very beginning of this, and I can speak to which kinds are more common or not in certain sections of the text, which is kind of interesting to me. I'm trying to keep track of that and then later 
we'll go back and sort of think about um, how, to, how to tell stories with that and what that might help us to think about. Is there any way of using technology to help make that real person easier, so, i.e. a program that actually is interesting? So you told us what you could do. I, I don't know of any OCR program where you that reads mantras. Right? I mean, there's just not a whole lot of demand. Right, um, we're still at the very beginning of scripts for Mac and PCs that you know um, you can use Manchu. Like, there's not a whole lot of scripts for Mac that lets you type out Manchu alphabetically. But what I could do if I was interested in doing this, and someone else could do this if they were interested in doing this, is I could transcribe all of this into um, Romanized letters, right? Um, into alphabetic letters. I could create a digital text, and then I could search that text, right, and basically create like a, a digitized version by rendering these into alphabetic scripts, right? Just like, and then doing that. Um, I am not interested in doing that. So I actually really like reading the text and looking at it anew as a piece like this um, and experiencing it that way. Not because I think it's better or more efficient than the other way. The other way is probably more efficient for a lot of things. This is just how I prefer to read this text, but it certainly would be possible to do the other. Um, and maybe, you know, someone might do that and um, you can so when you when you transform a text into a digital object or you transform it into a database you're creating a new object right there's a relationship there but it, it's actually a new kind of object that entails and, and invites a different kind of reading um, and for this project that's not the kind of reading that I'm interested in doing but it would be super interesting for other kinds of things can I ask you one more question yeah. Um, and uh, so when you're talking about uh, likeness, mm -hmm. so in a way, are you, I mean, that relationship, are you sort of looking now at metaphors for that particular body part that they, they use? If you're, if you're sort of focusing on likeness, mm -hmm. uh, in a way, you're creating a, a new type of metaphor, sort of. Is that, is that fair? Or? Um, metaphor is one way of um, and to, to kind of back up for a minute, um, I'm really, one of the things that prompted me in the first place, bless you, is that for me, I've been interested for a long time in the way saying that this is like this is actually historically confusing. Right? In different places and different times, what being like is is actually what is very, very different. Even now, right? It, it's not self-evident that at like fundamentally and objectively this is like this. Like in a particular context, do you see what I mean? So likeness has a history. And so I've been interested in trying to figure out how to, as a historian, get at that for a long time. Um, so this is my the most concrete way that I've found to start to do that, even in a limited way. Metaphor is one way of producing likeness. I don't see metaphor as I understand metaphor to work yet in this text. I see um, this shape is like this shape. This is like that. But metaphor is a very particular kind of language technology, linguistic technology. I don't yet see that in the material that I've looked at. That doesn't mean that's not findable in this text. It just means I'm not, I'm not there yet. That sensory experiences apparently cannot be verbalized without using a language. There's just no way of describing these words that don't use the same form of language or reference. So no words that can be really objective or rendition of the sensory Let's say neutral. Um, that? One that is not one that not does not make a reference of the same. So you could argue that all sensory is a subject of experiment, that a person finding a creative conversation would be able to experience that person as well. You could argue that like what I'm doing when I smell something, what that objective experience is like for me, already embedded in a whole host of other things I've experienced, I'm seeing, I know, which means fundamentally. I would feel like that experience can characterize even if you were to the same thing, like there's no objective. Right, but that is a word, that is a word concept. I mean, when you 
born in the temple, required by God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, no, I'm, I'm thinking for example. For example, you see, in, in some literature you read astrologers call this. No, you've never heard of the astrologer. But, but you imagine some power. Mm -hmm. And then when you hear the astrologer, in here in terms of writing is not in claiming that by reading the description of the bones of the nose in terms of like Manchu architectural features, right? It's a, that someone necessarily then understands the presence of like that they would be able to see a nose in nature and say, oh, now I recognize it. So I'm not, um, I'm not trying to argue for that. I am just trying to understand the way that in times of Rupture, they're trying to describe things in a way to write. And I'm trying to get yeah, a sense. I understand yeah. what you're saying. I can also make a little remark that it's a bit of an aside. I mean, so one of the things that's really interesting, so I do, um, I teach the students to know a lot of different courses that are paid to be the Dabbing Java. And usually what I do, and this, this speaks to your, um, I think this is related to your question of the conflict in this. So what I do as an exercise is that the singer in LA creates the things that are supposed to embody a character in a novel or a concept or um, a painting or a book. And she makes the things that are supposed to embody this experience. And they, they come in little, um, they're called indices, they come in little bars and they're labeled. So what I do as an exercise is I take, I make a record of the names, I take, I take the labels and I number them and I give them to my students as a baseline. Now, one, uh, all we're supposed to do is to smell it, write about the experience, and then try to identify it. They come in, they like you have to um, they share their what they think it is, and then I have to reveal and I tell them what it's supposed to be. And then they smell it again. And in almost every single time that someone's told me their experience of this, they say that what they actually smell the second time is different from what they smell the and this is, I use this as a way to try to um, get them, get all of us to think about the way that even the pure spirit, sensory experience is shaped by language. So I think, so this is why I'm saying, even like pure sensory experience, I'm not sure that it's not already always shaped by the environment, the language and the image and the other symbols that we're receiving. You know, we don't have to believe this. source of archival relationship, right? And so um, it, it's uh, another upkeep from um, what has been experienced, right? So I'm, and it is socially and culturally constructed. Totally. Um, yeah. So I, so totally. So I am, I'm just at the beginning of this process, but already what's been really surprising to me has been the material, the habitual environment out of the translation. So it was really surprising to me um, when I kept track of the things that were compared to, the more familiar things that were compared to other things, to put those together and try to create a picture of, like, what are the household objects that they're assuming to be a familiar with? What are the, um, and the objects themselves aren't always individually surprising, but what's surprising to me is that you see that. Like, I 
Yes. You don't understand. It's just hard to give the picture of the visual environment, and I hadn't expected that. That wasn't something that I went in, and I didn't even go in um, really expecting lighting to be important. I just went in kind of. I had had this interest in lighting. I started getting super interested in compositions and compositionality, and I started looking at this. And initially, the project was start with like lightness, but I started seeing lightness all over the place in like. So those are just some of the things that were surprising to me. Um, yeah, and I meant to go on, but, but yeah, so that, that whole that's been really surprising to me. Yeah. I wonder that how this can then um, return to medicine or medical tech. And and the reason I'm the thing I'm thinking about is um, this debate going on now about the physical exam versus the computer, and that mm -hmm. um, especially in the pre-modern, early modern um, period, but re really up to extremely recently, <laughs> that, the rela that medicine is relational. It's the relationship between the physician and the patient, and that the physical exam is all about how things sound, how, how the patient sounds, mm -hmm. how they smell, how they look, and this is something that Abraham Bergesi has been arguing that, you know, he had this, he said there's a danger of the eye patient, this sort of patient who's, who's the, the digital patient is getting perfect care and, and mm -hmm. everyone's talking about this series of computer, you know, exams of this person. And the actual person is like, hey, <laughs> sitting here by myself in his, in his bed, what about me? Am I going to get some attention? And that there was a woman who had come to him who had not been physically examined. And he physically examined her breast and found it had this classic peau d'orange, orange skin. Again, another ana uh, uh, analogy yeah. Yeah. that um, a, an indication of cancer is that the skin looks like the skin of an orange. And that, and that medicine is full of these. And that, because what do you say? Yeah. It's kind of mushy and you open somebody up and it's like, well, that's where that mushy part and then this mushy part and that black part. Than the wet part, you really have to really <laughs> help people understand the differences, and also like how it sounds. Like if you touch someone, if you touch someone, it's going to sound like this if there's a mess. It's going to sound like this if it's if it's this. So in fact, medicine itself mm -hmm. is this series of relation uh, relations, mm -hmm. and that it, the experience of illness. Like when I'm sick, I don't think, and now the mic will be sent through this. Now my lips really going to swell up, and now like I feel pain, and and then I feel parts of my body related to each other. Mm -hmm. That maybe, or I become acutely aware of the ways that, like my ear and my throat are connected in ways that I'm not usually because of they hurt, or I have uh, um, these kind of bizarre um, concomitant new relations. Mm -hmm. That my belly hurts or it feels heavy and that I feel sleepy and things that it feels out of whack, that you're having new relations of things that you're not used to, mm -hmm. and that change is very unpleasant. There's um there's some really I I don't need to tell this or a lot of the people here about this, but all the really interesting work about the relationship between the gut and mental health. Right? Mm -hmm. There's an amazing book um, called Gut um, I think it's amazing called Gut Feminism. Um, which is very much trying to think about. Does that mean your gut is a feminist? It means it's a. a it's um. I haven't read it in long enough that I'd be irresponsible if I tried to describe it accurately now. But I did an, um, a podcast interview with the author, um, so I could send you a link to the podcast. She's brilliant, and the book is brilliant. But part of it is trying to speak to ways of understanding the body such that there are connections between the gut, gut health, and mental health in ways that like if you think about things such as cysting, you don't think about your gut health as being like influencing how you feel and what you think about. Um, but what I wanted to, to to say is even so when I'm teaching, right, and I have students who are like, but there's one physical medical body and that's objectively biologically true and it's the same for everyone, right? When you go to the doctor, there's obviously one thing that's wrong with you. Um, we talk about ways that if I'm doing this, any, anyone in here were to describe what I'm doing, 
same body, you're seeing the same thing. What am I doing? Like, wait, what, what do you see? gesturing and walking towards me. Like there are probably infinite ways to describe what you're observing right now, and what you call it and what you're labeling it is based on the language that you learn to describe how we normally work as physical bodies in the world, right? So if you see this and you associate it with your knowledge of taking a pulse, you're going to see me taking a pulse. If instead you have an understanding of the body where these are chi flows and I'm moving my chi, you're going to see that. Like how we perceive is very much about the context that we're so um, I say this because this likeness and production of likeness, you could even extend that to the fact that when you, something, you're having pain in your head, you call it a headache. That's likening it to something else. Even though we take that, a lot of us take that for granted as an unproblematic objective description of what's happening in my head hurts, that's one way of describing what that experience is that comes from my likening this to what I have learned is a normal way of language and that experience and being able to tell a story about experience that is going to generate a, like a, an alleviation of that, of that experience, right? Of that pain. That's also a relationship with likeness and it's a certain way of telling a story and it's not self-evident that that's how I have to describe the experience here. So there's all kinds of ways that we even I think take for granted um, that shape how we experience our bodies that are related to this. Yeah. Really, uh, I like the way you talk about text, and I think uh, it's definitely important. Right? And let me just ask you a question that is for young and employees. Sure. Uh, we, uh, may, we might have been standing in a very similar way. Yeah, but uh, my students would, would raise the question when I, when they listen to your talk, immediately one of the things that will come to your mind is uh, that text was created in external source, probably for the purpose of showing. What were the prophetic purposes of the text mm -hmm. as articulated by the people who created the text? Right. And so what I would say about that would be like one of at least two things. One of them would be I don't have documentary evidence um, of people ex explicitly expressing expressing their intentionality in creating the text. Um, and so I'm not speaking to that. Like I'm trying to tell the kind of story with this text that is tellable without the kind of robust spatial like a archives that you would need to answer certain kinds of questions that can be raised in this text. What I would also say is, or what I can also say is, that's a great question. And another historian who I've just done internships who wanted to dig into this text might be interested in asking that question, and that would be a great question. And that would be what I would like to have a whole experience for as well. But that's that's great because this um, history and business is a really That text does not have an introduction and say the articulated purposes of the text. Well, I mean, I read you some of that passage, right? Like it's, it's they're articulating the purpose of understanding the immaterial Lord um, by understanding the relationship in the material body and the immaterial Lord and soul doing that is a kind of statement of the purpose of the text. Um, we're both seeing it with our senses, right? So we know that we don't have the same way of doing something. It's not always the Because of that, and because I feel that to be really true, like on a fundamental level, it's rare that in my work I make explicit claims about the intentionality um, or claim to speak for the voices of the past of the people who I'm <coughs> writing about. I tend to really deliberately be talking about texts, about texts, um, because that's my particular commitment, not because I think that's like fundamentally better, right, than other ways of doing history. I love the fact that we're in a business where like we don't have to be like one way, right? Otherwise, why don't I just sit in a room and write this stuff and write stuff and not talk about it? Right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, at the beginning, you mentioned 
the Qing dynasty being an imperialist time, yeah. and that that's kind of something that you're interested in. This whole analysis of materialism reminds me of Marx and his analysis of imperialism. You know what I mean? Marx and analysis of imperialism? Well, like, yeah. I don't Well, I don't know exactly. It's a whole history of imperialism that's based on material relations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see where you're going with that. Okay. Yeah. That, that, I mean, so the material um, bases for life and relating to, yeah, I mean, I could totally see where you're making that connection. Is there, so all I can say is like, yeah, that's super cool. Like, mm -hmm. we could think about that more. <laughs> and I love that you're making that connection. Is um, do you want to talk about that more, or is that like should we just leave that for people? Yeah, let's just leave that for now. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. This one's kind of a comment. I'm reminded of Sri Vasudeva's book talking about four ages made up of Chinese Wikipedia. It seems like you've taken that project to the creative kingdom. <laughs> um, that's a really, in, yeah, like that's that's not a normal thing to do to what I'm doing. I mean, I'm interested in. And I'm not a historian, but it seems I, like I know my founder story. So my the tyranny that I fight is the tyranny of representation, the impossibility of representing the tyranny of representation in the historic sense. And it seems like you're you're responding. And it seems like you just sidestepped or just decided that that's not the problem. Right. So that's, that's fantastic. Not a question. <laughs> yeah. No, no, totally. I mean, I think um, at some point, and I've talked about this over the past couple of days with various um, clusters of you in various contexts in, in one way, in one form or another, but I think you get to a point in your in a career as a academic and also like as a human where hopefully for me i'll just say for me i think um the point that i'm at is a point where like pre-tenure but then immediately like immediately post-tenure you ask yourself like okay i've got tenure like what am i doing here right like i'm off the treadmill like what the hell and i started reorienting toward really asking myself what am i interested in what do i care about and what do i have what do I have to bring to the table? So rather than like listening to all the voices that, you know, during my training and stuff that were like, you're not supposed to be interested in like philosophy and this and this, you have to train as a Chinese historian that you can do in your spare time. This is what you're supposed to look like. And I'm like, well, I don't do that. I got tenure and then I was just like, okay, I'm not gonna try to like be, um, make myself into a golem of what I think the Chinese historians are supposed to look like. So I actually have stuff to say. I have stuff to add to the conversation. And I'm just going to full on do that and decide that that's good enough and that's okay and make clear that I'm not telling anybody in front of me to try and do that. And part of that for me is about this deep commitment to just saying, like, I'm not trying to represent the past. You know, like, I'm not trying to speak for the voices of the past because, in part, my whole conception of, like, I can't even speak for myself. I can't speak for, you know, we're in the same group here. Like, what am I doing claiming to understand and speak for a whole person in the past? And I don't necessarily even believe that a whole person is a coherent, like, right, self, like, multiple, like, so, yeah, so in my, to close with, in my project to just, like, be who I am as a historian, that involves speaking from that kind of commitment, um, but without necessarily, I'm not interested in arguing that other people should also agree with me. You know, like it's fine, like let's just agree that that's what I'm looking for. So um, now I'm, I'm thinking about this following the Bentu question um, is, you know, this text seems so rich and that you could look at it, you could use it as evidence for different stories. Totally. And that one story, and I know almost nothing about Chinese history, <laughs> but if there's a, at one point if the Chinese um, emperor's 
like these these Jesuits are just out of control. Like we have to just kind of they are just getting, you know, these Europeans are just like they're much too inclusive. They're putting their hands on our commerce, they're being very too much. They're like, you guys stay in this very confined, you know, defined what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do, and you just stay in it. And that one of the things they're allowed to do is translate texts that the emperor thinks are useful. And clearly they're like, and then see science is really good because God and Jesus and well, let's think about God and Jesus. And so under the root of that door, we're gonna get our little message from right. you about God and Jesus that we can we can't we have door to door. So instead we have our American humanity and really serious about it. And then from my perspective, I'm geeking out on the script because I'm because I'm like, oh, this is such a cool I'm really into like the, the medical transition of texts and how like the Lenic medicine goes to the Islamic world and then it goes to the West. And so you've got this like heteroclite text that's showing you how diverse China really is, that it's not like just one language and just one ethnicity, it's all these different things, and that it's all these different things that are coming together in this text. And that even in the script itself and the language itself, there's this like, you know, this um, ethnic variety and linguistic. And so the, the approaches that I would have had to the text are more the kinds of things that, you know, like from a kind of like standard history training yeah. perspective, like those are the kind of things that my brain immediately goes to. So, um, so I'm wondering if you were going to um, categorize or, and I know you don't want to categorize, <laughs> I know you want to escape category, but I, if you were going to say, I'm doing the history of, I'm thinking, like, are you doing the history of what it is to be alive in in this place and time and to sense things and to be related to the physical world? Like, this is this is how it feels to sort of be alive, and this is the way the body, the body which apparently doesn't have any parts, but the body that I'm kind of in and inhabiting, this is this is how I feel in my body and this is how I relate to my physical world and this is how the body this is how it is to be alive at this time and place. I can't access that through this textual archive, right? I okay. can't access the experience of what it is to be alive through this archive. Um, if I were a course in a history graduate program, I'd be in that history, right? So everything that I do is ultimately fundamentally about methodology. It's about practice. And this, as much as anything else, is about um, trying to help readers learn to see differently and learn to read differently. And it happens that you also might learn something about Manchu bodies, um, about the Manchu language, about this Manchu archive in the process. And so it can speak to that. But I wouldn't say this is a history of these things as much as it's a history and conversation with questions about those things. Like historical practice, what can a historian do to kind of make juicy and, ex and interesting and capacious questions about those things? This is one of the things that historians can do. But that doesn't mean that this is a history of those things. If what you're looking for in a history of those things is some kind of coherent story about change over time, which is what a lot of people look for. And they're probably always pushing you. Oh yeah. They always want the change because that, that's how uh, that we're like a team. That's how that's the only way we think. And then what? And then and how does it change? But um at the same time, <laughs> at the same time, I've had some really great conversations with historians who, you know, are all the time who are interested in what it is that we do when we practice our craft. And that's fundamentally what my work is speaking to. So if you're looking to this work with the expectation of a story about Qing medicine over time, you won't be um, satisfied. But if you're looking as a historian at this work um, like for kind of to try to think about how we practice our craft and what that could look like and how to expand that, then this is going to be hopefully how to tell the story. So there's just like there's a lot of ways of being a historian, right? There's a lot of different kinds of historians out there. Yes, some of them are just like, that's not what I expect. Wrong, but, but others <laughs> aren't. You know, others are, aren't at all. Historian, I'm always looking for new different work to answer these language versus history of signature. So there's 
here with the illustration of what we call is easier to interpret for our receiver. I think that that is an interesting question. I don't know if you have an answer. No, no, I totally don't have an answer. It's a really question. And I think it depends maybe on who the interpreter is and who the interpreter is. So what I can say among um, 20th century readers of this text, right, and in very different on who's looking at this, some have seen um, a really fascinating art history of it. And they're really interested in, for example, the way the clothing here says something to them, right, about sort of like in the context of visual representation of black and an identity, right? Other people looking at this, right, are, so it's, it's, there's no one, um, there's no one answer, but it is definitely the case that different kinds of viewers of this text already, without my propositional stuff, already see very different kinds of things depending on what they're looking for. But for me, not seeing it as any kind of historical discipline at all, when I see this, like I don't, I can't say anything concrete, right, about the sort of the, how this image speaks in a larger context of um, visual imagery, imagery or imagery around clothing or hair or places of identity. That's not a set of licenses that I have experience with, but other people have as well. Um, and I'm just going to talk to you about some of that. Mm -hmm. The language of correspondence is so very distinct. Mm -hmm. Is there any so for like esoteric Buddhist technology mm -hmm. and, and, and all, of, all of our correspondence is by viscera. So, um, so this is really, really interesting. And this, yeah, and Jude Weiss, can I answer this? Yep, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Oh, yeah. Do it. Do it. Um, okay, so to get at that question, I'm going to first step back and, and just say a little bit about the relationship between my context. So I've been talking about this um, for, for various reasons, as you know, much you would just think sometimes, if you look at the history of Manchu literature, though, and that sort of Manchu language, in the Qing, they are always in conversation. Like, arguably, and I have a, the translation book that I mentioned right at the beginning, one of the implicit arguments of that book is that Manchu and Chinese are always in conversation. Thinking about them and talking about them separately in the Qing is actually to, to not really understand what's going on. So Manchu is always in conversation with Chinese. And you see different genres of Manchu writing changing over time, depending on the audiences that so it's easy to see that in some texts, like for example, um, this, let me see, where is this? Okay. This page that I've shown you of Manchu poetry, this poet, this is a, um, this is from an early 19th century text. Um, there's only one copy of this that we know of in the world. It's held in the Harvard Yenching collection. Um, and this volume of Manchu poetry, the author and the translator Okay, so it's from a collection, and it'll get to correspondence, you'll see. Um, so this is from a text that is eight volumes, eight drafts. The first seven are Manchu translations of Chinese poetry, which is fascinating, I think, for its own sake, that like there's revived stuff in Manchu, there's like Yu Fu in Manchu, which is like blew my mind when I first saw it, because like no one writes about this stuff, because it's only in translation, right? So that's a whole other thing, but the whole, um, the eight volumes is all his original poems in Manchu. In a lot of these poems, you have Manchu reflections on the five pages. You have Manchu terminology for um, languages of correspondence and all sorts of stuff, which otherwise I don't see in a lot of other Manchu texts. And it's very much, I think, I argue, a product of his experience translating Chinese poetry and performing through his poetry his expertise and his control over both the Chinese poetic archive and Manchu literature. So it's not that this, I'm showing you this only to say it's not the And in part, that's because um, in a lot of different areas, Manchu and Chinese, like poetry, each other in this period, mm -hmm. in an important way. It is the case 
things though that in this text I don't see the Clark student or depicting the correspondence uh, in the same way. Right? There's not the same kind of the five years that Paul got and all of these um, other things. Sorry, I just didn't want to finish. Oh, yeah, I yeah, thought yeah. you said like instead of metaphor, it's like this shape or it's like that shape. Oh, so, so that's that, so you don't mean like this like five phase or like a system well, of correspondence. You mean just like one I'm, answer, like the I'm curious to know if that window. Yeah, okay, so that broader. Yeah, totally. Okay, so I can see you um, agree with again. So it, there's not the kind of like system of correspondence, right? right? But definitely you could call it correspondence. Um, but there's not um, a language of resonances throughout the text that would be consistent, right? But if you just want to say that the act of saying this looks like that, this is like that, is correspondence, then yes, that's always a good time. The reason I'm pulling um, back a little bit from metaphor. Because when I've talked about uh, this material and other material before in context with literary scholars, for example, mm -hmm. um, like metaphor has a very particular kind, of, a very particular kind of linguistic technology for that. So I, um, given that, <coughs> to bless you, that very particular way of using likeness is not something that necessarily seems like that broad. But if we wanted to have kind of a more broad definition of what metaphor is, we could define it as kind of use this like in these kind of literary critic like discussions or conflict programs, for example. <laughs> like I've been, you know, like it's a it's not metaphor in that sense. And even if you can kind of attack them, it's still like that. Like metaphor um, explicitly invokes the creative process. Whereas correspondence, I'm thinking, creates more of a, an as suchness in the world. Like it's triangular, it's a triangle, like there's no creative process involved in this. Like, is that, Definitely. that's what I'm getting at with correspondence as opposed oh, to the creative um, element. So I, um, I mean, just the way I understand like these kind of stories that we kind of tell about this here is very much a story about this is a creative process, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think that's kind of why I, when I'm using language to describe this, I'm also using this kind of like the production of likeness, mm -hmm. the production of schemes, as a way to just flag the fact that it's not self-evident that two things in the world are, are alike. That has to be, yeah, right, that can act, it can move that way. And so I, I yes. So I, I tend to just think of it as like a production of schemes or a production of likeness really, not, and, and not to use correspondence, but I haven't really reflected deeply on why that like yeah. this is the first time I'm reflecting deeply. Yeah, I mean, of course, it could be, it could work because correspondence on one level mm -hmm. implies a naturalness that occurs. But if you're actually thinking about yeah. it, of course, an act of production is an act of production that kind of calls itself. Right. In the, I t maybe I tend to shy away from the language of correspondence too, though, because in the like Chinese medicine school, the history of Chinese medicine literature, it's just like where I was trained. Yeah. Once you say correspondence, like already. In the constellation of like the medicine of systematic correspondence and the five phases and all that stuff, and that's like not what I want to do here. Okay. Mm -hmm. We don't have to you know do Q and A if you want. Well, we would like, like to break for a little or informal um, conversation. Can you keep it to three? Because I can't <laughs> eat them. So we have taken off the cookies and bring your hungry friends who are highly deserving. Study, so take one of the cookies with you. And I want you to join me in thanking Dr. Matthew for sharing oh, the work. Thank you so much.